Humans are said to occupy two distinct worlds, the real physical world and a mental world, which we superimpose on top of the physical world in order to make sense of the world. This mental world can be best described as an analog of the physical world, in the same way that a map is an analog of a region of land. The map is a representation which corresponds to the various features of the land and is yet distinct from the land itself. In a similar manner, our minds generate an analog of the world, which enables us to categorize the world in a way that makes sense to us. And yet, we often don't realize that this analog world is just a mental construction. We also often fail to realize that this imaginary analog world is fundamental for human cooperation because, as far as we know, humans are the only species that look at the world in this way. To understand the extent of the analog world, we will need to understand how it is generated. Human language is unique because it has two functions. The first is that we use it to communicate with other people by transferring information to them. But language is also a tool which allows us to communicate with ourselves and make detailed observations about our environment. As Julian Jaynes writes, language is an organ of perception, not merely a means of communication. What would your mentality be like if you never learned a language? When you see these objects on the screen, you know what they are, partially because language can help us to quickly categorize things. If we don't know what something is, however, we usually use a metaphor to describe it, likening it to something we do know. It is by metaphor that language grows. The common reply to the question, what is it like, is, when the reply is difficult or the experience unique, well, it is like. In laboratory studies, both children and adults describing nonsense objects, or metaphrans, to others who cannot see them use extended metaphors that with repetition become contracted into labels. This is the major way in which the vocabulary of language is formed. The grand and vigorous function of metaphor is the generation of new language as it is needed, as human culture becomes more and more complex. When we use a metaphor, we associate something we know and understand well with a new object or concept in order to help us understand what it is. Because of this process, ideas and objects in the physical world become labeled by our language, and it is hard to grasp the sheer number of ideas which language allows us to perceive, and we impose these ideas onto the world as we go about our lives. This linguistic filter generates a mental map of the world based on what we know about the world, and it is this analog world that gives rise to human consciousness. Take the example of a tree. A tree is both a physical object in the real world, but it is also a mental concept in our minds, which refers to a wide range of objects. When we consciously think of a tree, we are indeed conscious of a particular tree, of the fir or the oak or the elm that grew beside our house, and let it stand for the concept, just as we can let a concept word stand for it as well. In fact, one of the great functions of language is to let the word stand for a concept, which is exactly what we do in writing or speaking about conceptual material. Depending on the culture you come from, or your past life experiences, you may impose the concept tree onto a number of different objects. Some people may also categorize this object as a tree, but others may disagree and categorize it with a different word, such as bush or shrub. People who have learned different languages may therefore see the world in fundamentally different ways. We are constantly generating mental conceptions which are meant to stand for ideas in the world, but often, our mental impositions differ from the actual world. Historically, people believed that the Earth was flat. We can say that the idea of a flat Earth is a part of the analog world of these people, i.e., their mental conception of the world is one where the Earth is a flat plane. However, as we have gathered more information, we have modified our analog worlds to fit the data of the actual world. Thus, a spherical Earth is part of the analog world of most people today. This highlights the clear distinction about the way we think about the world and the world itself. Since people can only experience so much within a single lifetime, we need to be able to make generalizations about the world with the data we do have. It is interesting to note how many things are really just analogs in our own minds. What about other people? When you imagine another person, such as a friend you like or someone you dislike, you create an analog of that person based on your past experiences with them and their personality. However, it is quite likely that this imagination doesn't capture the true complexity of the person, and is just an analogical representation based on what we know about that person. 
Because we can only experience our own minds, it is difficult to understand the extent to which we fail to grasp the complexity of another person. If we know them well, then our analog of them may be fairly accurate, but if we don't know them too well, then our analogs are generated from a limited amount of information. But even when we think about ourselves, we generate an analog of who we believe ourselves to be. So far, we have only discussed examples where our analogs are meant to represent physical things in the real world. However, there are also features of the analog world which don't correspond to anything physical. Rather, they are part of an invented fiction existing in our collective imagination which makes human civilization possible. For example, what is the date today? Depending on when you watch this, it may be the 10th of November or the 23rd of February, but the way we organize time is analogically constructed. Or, in other words, it is a way of categorizing time such that we can say that the date today is such and such, and we impose these categorizations onto our experience of time. The month, day, and even the year is a human construction, which is undoubtedly very important for human behavior. Even the time of day is something which, when you think about it, really only exists in our minds. We divide the day into 24 hours, but we could divide it into 10 hours, or 100. We also decide how long a second is. The current definition of a second is related to something called the hyperfine transition frequency of a cesium atom. We could easily choose a different definition of a second, and adjust our clocks accordingly. To be clear, time is not a mental construction, but how we categorize time is something we impose on our experience of time, so that we can all agree on the time and date. The historian Yuval Noah Harari goes even further, and argues that human society is built on a fictional basis, and myths are essential for civilization. As he writes, Large numbers of strangers can cooperate successfully by believing in common myths. Any large-scale human cooperation, whether a modern state, a medieval church, an ancient city, or an archaic tribe, is rooted in common myths, which exist only in people's collective imagination. According to Harari, part of the reason humans are able to cooperate on a vast scale is because of the fact that we are able to believe in fictions which represent ideas in the real world. This collective fiction extends to very important ideas. The laws of a country, for example, are not immutable. Rather, they are invented and exist only insofar as everybody is willing to believe them and governments are willing to enforce them. Nations, religions, governments, and companies are all, technically speaking, imaginary entities. A company may be comprised of physical assets and people, but the company itself is a fictional entity. Harari uses the example of the car company Peugeot to make his point. In short, Peugeot SA seems to have no essential connection to the physical world. Does it really exist? Peugeot is a figment of our collective imagination. Lawyers call this a legal fiction. It can't be pointed at, it is not a physical object, but exists as a legal entity. Believing in these fictitious entities is a part of human mentality, and participation in a collective fiction is fundamental for structuring society. Just try to imagine how difficult it would have been to create states or churches or legal systems if we could only speak about things that really exist, such as rivers, trees, and lions. Over the years, people have woven an incredibly complex network of stories. Within this network, fictions such as Peugeot not only exist, but also accumulate immense power. The kinds of things which people create through this network of stories are known in academic circles as fictions, social constructs, or imagined realities. Amazingly, even money is a part of the collective fiction in which we all participate. The value of money is something we all believe in, and so there is no inherent value in money. The only reason money has value is because we all participate in a fictional conception of the world where money does have value, or in other words, its value is derived from the fact that we all agree that it has value. Were it otherwise, commerce would not be possible, and our civilization would not be able to function. It is strange to realize that the value of money only exists in our collective imagination, and yet this belief is so strong that it is nearly impossible to deny. The concept of the analog world may seem insignificant, but we can get a better sense of it with the following thought experiment. Imagine you lived in the UK, in the city of London, on a street called Thompson Street. All of these are a part of your analog world, i.e. they are mental impositions onto a physical world. At first, it may seem that all these features aren't analogically constructed, 
But imagine you had a pet dog that lived with you on Thompson Street. Does your dog know that it lives on Thompson Street? Does he know that he lives in a city called London, or that he lives in a nation called the United Kingdom? In fact, your dog wouldn't know that it lives on an island called Great Britain, or even on a planet called Earth. This is because Great Britain and Earth are linguistic categories, but it is also because your dog doesn't need to generate an analog of the world, and so concepts like planet or island don't exist in a dog's mind. Your dog might be very clever, but he probably has no conception of how big the world really is, because this information isn't needed. A dog's mental life is largely preoccupied with the present, and certain mental conceptions are not relevant to its way of life. Recall how I mentioned that our analogs of the world widen as we better understand it. An example of this is that we know that our bodies have a circulatory system, and that our hearts pump blood around the body. But does a dog know this? A dog wouldn't have any mental conception of its internal organs, and lives its life without ever being conscious of the mechanics of its own body, just as humans were previously unconscious of this fact. Our knowledge of this fact is based on a mentally constructed analog, but there are a lot of things we don't know. As our knowledge of the world expands, our analogs of the world also expand, widening our field of consciousness. We often don't realize how our mental conceptions influence the way we look at the world. Even our unconscious psyche also predisposes us to think about the world in certain ways. The analog world is a purely mental construction, which sometimes has a collective basis, which we superimpose onto the world, and thus our knowledge is always conditioned by the psyche, or as Carl Jung puts it. Although common prejudice still believes that the sole essential basis of our knowledge is given exclusively from outside, it nevertheless remains true that the thoroughly respectable atomic theory of Leucippus and Democritus was not based on any observations of atomic fission, but on a mythological conception of smallest particles, which, as the smallest animated parts, the soul atoms, are known even to the still Paleolithic inhabitants of Central Australia. How much soul is projected into the unknown in the world of external appearances is, of course, familiar to anyone acquainted with natural science and natural philosophy of the ancients. It is, in fact, so much that we are absolutely incapable of saying how the world is constituted in itself, and always shall be, since we are obliged to convert physical events into psychic processes, as soon as we want to say anything about knowledge. But who can guarantee that this conversion produces anything like an adequate, objective picture of the world? That could only be if the physical event were also a psychic one. But a great distance still seems to separate us from such an assertion. Till then, we must, for better or worse, content ourselves with the assumption that the psyche supplies those images and forms which alone make knowledge of objects possible.